Oh my god, they're dead! Who could have done such a heinous act? I bet it was that frog down by the swamp. I don't like that frog. He's got them shifty eyes. It was that convict Ironjaw, that rapscallion. I bet it was that strange shadowy figure that likes to swing in the park on Thursday nights. I swear to you, it was my stuffed panda. He's, he's possessed. It could have been Ricky's arm. We haven't seen it since it got cut off. I definitely know who the killer is. That that way. Way. Blank is the killer. Hello and welcome to Blank is the Killer, the unoriginal horror movie podcast where I, your death negotiator Josh Baker, cover six new-to-me horror movies with a random spooky topic seven at the end. This episode includes killer bees, deadly dolls, and fashion fatales. I'm not going to remind you that you can email me at blankisthekiller at gmail.com in the intro of this episode, so follow me as we look at haunting graffiti and definitely all believe that Candyman is real. Number 1, The Gift, 2000, directed by Sam Raimi. A sidekick named Annie does readings for people in her town. She helps a guy named Buddy with some issues. She also helps police find the body of a girl named Jessica in a pond belonging to a guy named Donnie. Buddy's dad sexually abused him when he was a kid. Buddy lights him on fire and goes to a mental hospital. Donnie is charged with Jessica's murder, but Annie doesn't think he actually did it. Annie realizes the actual killer is Wayne, Jessica's fiancé, who was tired of her cheating on him. Annie figures this out after having a vision while at the pond with Wayne. He attacks her, and Buddy, who says he escaped the hospital, saves Annie. Buddy disappears and Annie learns that he hanged himself in the hospital hours before he saved her. Wayne is the killer. This is the first movie I've seen from Sam Raimi that has a serious vibe throughout. His Raimi-isms still show, but they're muted given the tone of this movie. The Gift is way darker and grittier than The Evil Dead and Spider-Man. Keanu Reeves even drops a hard R in The Gift as Donnie Barksdale for no real reason other than lazy writing. Donnie beats his wife, cheats on her, threatens Annie and her children, but since that's not enough for the audience to realize he's a big fat jerk, the script also called for a random hard R. It's weird and completely out of place. Am I supposed to be like, oh, it's cool that you beat women, Donnie, but I draw the line at racism. Keanu Reeves is probably the worst possible person for the role of Donnie. He looks like a puppy dog man, not some wife-beating hick. His beard is even perfectly manicured in the movie. If you're going to have Keanu play a racist, misogynist, backwoods character, at least rough him up with some styling and makeup effects. Keanu's acting doesn't really work in the gift, but props to him for trying to play a character that doesn't fit him at all. For those curious, The Gift was written by Billy Bob Thornton and Tom Epperson. Yes, that Billy Bob Thornton. It's said to be based on his mom's psychic abilities. He's actually written several movies. He even won an Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay for Sling Blade. Anyway, we're talking about The Gift. The movie is a by-the-book whodunit. You instantly know Wayne is the killer as soon as you find out Jessica is dead. Why did I even decide to watch this? Well, it's directed by Sam Raimi and has a star-studded cast including Keanu Reeves, Kate Blanchett, Katie Holmes, J.K. Simmons, Hilary Swank, and Giovanni Ribisi. The best performances come from Blanchett and Ribisi. Pretty much everyone in the movie does a poor southern accent though. I guess the main reason I decided to watch The Gift was to see Raimi direct something a little outside his wheelhouse. The Gift isn't an amazing movie, but that's not due to Raimi's directing, it's just a mediocre movie. I think the movie would have worked better with a thick layer of camp. As it is, The Gift is just another whodunit thriller at the bottom of a pond filled with other whodunit thrillers. 
Nothing makes it stand out. It's predictable. I did love seeing Raimi's more campy style peek out at times, like when Annie slips on some spilt paint with an unintentionally silly sound effect added to the landing that didn't really fit the tone of the scene. I didn't think I was supposed to laugh seeing as Donnie knocks over the paint while pulling his wife out of Annie's house by the hair. Raimi's signature style also leaks out when Annie's having visions. There are lots of quick cuts and weird zooms. Of course, Annie drives a Delta 88 Oldsmobile. Katie Holmes plays Jessica and her corpse and ghost looked alright, but wasn't anything special. I've never been a fan of Katie Holmes. She's not bad in the gift, I just don't care for her. J.K. Simmons plays a character named Pearl Johnson. I only wanted to bring up the funny name. The ending is incredibly silly. Annie's been shown to be able to see ghosts. She sees her grandma, who's also Peter Parker's aunt, in her backyard. But it's a little goofy that Ghost Buddy is able to physically save Annie. The Gift isn't a great movie, but it's not an awful one either. It is too bland for me to recommend, though. Number 2, Candyman, 1992, directed by Bernard Rose. A graduate student named Helen is researching urban legends. She hears about one legend in particular, Candyman, who's allegedly responsible for murders at a nearby project called Cabrini Green. Helen investigates, ends up in a bathroom where a boy was said to be attacked, and is assaulted by a gang leader using the name Candyman. After she's attacked, police finally put in the effort to arrest the man responsible for the attack and other murders. The real Candyman then shows up and says he needs to kill since Helen said he wasn't real. Candyman frames Helen for killing a dog, kidnapping a baby, and murder. Helen is sent to a psychiatric hospital. Candyman kills a doctor who's meeting with Helen and she escapes. She goes to her apartment where she finds her husband with a young student. Helen heads back to Candyman's lair at Cabrini Green and gives herself up to be his victim. She then saves a baby from being unknowingly burned to death in a bonfire by sacrificing herself. Candyman also perishes in the fire. Helen's ex-husband says her name four times in a mirror, causing her to appear and kill him. Candyman and Helen are the killers. Cheating is bad, but it's not something that is punishable by death. Candyman is a movie based on a Clive Barker short story titled The Forbidden. Here are the main differences. The Forbidden is set in England. Helen is writing a thesis on graffiti. An old man is said to have been killed. Bathroom Kid is still in it, but Helen isn't assaulted in a bathroom or framed. A baby isn't kidnapped. Instead, a toddler is killed. Helen doesn't know anything about Candyman before he pops up. Candyman has no backstory. Helen tries to prove he exists by getting the toddler's corpse out of the bonfire where she ends up dying in Candyman's arms unnoticed. Like the movie, things are a little silly when the supernatural entity of Candyman shows up. I think both the short story and movie stories don't really work. I want to say I like the short story a little more than the movie. Welp, unfortunately, I have to live up to my name, Contrary Mary, again. The consensus on Candyman is crazy positive. I've seen it called a masterpiece, one of the best horror movies of the 90s, one of the best horror movies of all time even, and as someone who sat down and watched it for the first time in 2019, I thought it was just okay. Given its status as a horror classic, I expected a much stronger film, but it's a bit of a jumbled mess. I feel like half of it is a grounded story, trying to make a point about race and socioeconomics, and the other half is a silly, nonsensical slasher about a vengeful spirit. I enjoyed the dramatic, gothic score by Philip Glass. Virginia Madsen is fantastic as Helen. Tony Todd has an intense yet charismatic presence as Candyman. The production design looks great. The gore is practical and disturbing, and actual bees were applied to the actors. I was totally on board with Candyman up until the point where the real Candyman makes an appearance. That's when things started to feel a little silly, given how grounded and real the beginning of the movie is. 
This is a movie about a man who is killed by a mob coming back as a supernatural entity that murders people in order to stay in their minds, allowing him to live on. Wait a minute. That's the plot of another movie. Er, series. There's this really obscure series of movies that came out before Candyman. You might have heard of it. It's called A Nightmare on Elm Street. Sure, the mob was in the wrong when it comes to Candyman, and in the right when it comes to Freddy Krueger, but the basic premise of them coming back and being given power by people remembering them is the same. I'm not saying Candyman copied A Nightmare on Elm Street, I just think it's an interesting coincidence. Candyman starts off being about a bunch of different urban legends, so I have to assume it inspired movies like I Know What You Did Last Summer and Urban Legends. When Helen first starts investigating Candyman's lair in Cabrini Green, she finds pieces of candy with razor blades in them. Since at this point in the movie, we don't know the true origins of Candyman, I assumed he was called Candyman due to him passing out the bladed candy. But the actual candy is never brought up again and didn't really have a reason to be showcased in the movie. The razor bladed candy is in the short story, but it could have been easily left out. Things get a little muddled once Candyman's true origins are revealed in the movie. He was the son of a slave that worked his way out of poverty, became a painter, was asked to paint the virgin daughter of a rich white man, and fell in love with her which led to a pregnancy. Rich white dad didn't like that one bit, so he got together a mob who sawed off Candyman's painting hand and covered him in honey, which led to bees stinging him to death. I'm no bee expert, but I'm pretty sure bees wouldn't attack someone because they are covered in honey. They might attack people that steal the honey in order to lather someone up with it. Candyman might have made more sense if ants swarmed him. I just realized he's called Candyman because he was covered in honey. Maybe. It's not confirmed. The short story doesn't even have the honey backstory. Anyway, given that Candyman was wrongfully killed by a white mob, it's incredibly weird that he'd come back and start shedding innocent blood. I'd understand going after the relatives of the people that were responsible for his death, but Candyman kills anybody. Pet warning, the jerk even kills a dog. The actual dog killing is off screen, but the dog's decapitated head ends up front and center. Given the parallels to Freddy Krueger, I'm going to bring him up again. In life, Freddy was a child murderer, so it makes sense for him to continue killing once he becomes a supernatural entity. I guess that through an act of unjust violence, Candyman turned evil. That makes some sense, I suppose. I do think the commentary on race in Candyman is interesting even though it's not the most fleshed out. You have the cops that won't help when people that are actually living in Cabrini Green are being murdered, but as soon as one white lady is assaulted, they search the project top to bottom and catch the culprit. I had not heard about Cabrini Green before watching Candyman. It was a notorious public housing project in Chicago. Parts of the movie were actually filmed there. The producers let the ruling gang members appear in the movie in exchange for safety while filming. In Candyman, the idea for the bathroom cabinets easily being used as passageways between two units was taken from real life. A woman named Ruth Mae McCoy was murdered by men who accessed her apartment from another through her medicine cabinet. The original choice to play Candyman was Eddie Murphy. I don't see any way that would have worked. I'm still amazed by the use of actual bees in Candyman. The bees were bred specifically for the movie and used when they were around 11 hours old. At that time, their stingers aren't supposed to be fully developed. Tony Todd had real, living bees in his mouth. Throughout filming Candyman and its two sequels, he is said to have been stung at least 23 times. Mad props to Tony Todd for his work with the bees. Before I wrap this section up, I want to talk about Helen's actions in the parking garage right before she meets Candyman. Helen is given some developed camera slides. She thought the camera was completely destroyed. She walks through a parking garage looking at the small slides, and the look on her face is hilarious. She has a huge toothy grin and literally peers over her sunglasses to look at the pictures. 
She gawks at the pictures like a teenage boy ogling a nudie mag centerfold in a coming-of-age movie. It feels so out of place and elicited a laugh from me. I listened to an interview with Tony Todd and he considers the movie genre to be a gothic romance if the idea that Helen was Candyman's original lover reincarnated had more depth to it I think the movie could be called a gothic romance slasher. Candyman is not one of the best horror movies of all time. It is a passable slasher with underdeveloped romantic elements thrown in during the second half. If you've never seen Candyman I definitely think you should check it out, given that it's an iconic movie, but temper your expectations. Number 3, Candyman, Farewell to the Flesh, 1995, directed by Bill Condon. In New Orleans, a teacher named Annie and her family are surrounded by mysterious murders. Her brother is brought in as a suspect. Annie summons Candyman while trying to prove to her class he isn't real. Candyman is the one who's been killing and kills more people, including Annie's husband. Another one of Candyman's victims is a detective interrogating Annie's brother. Her brother tries to escape and is shot dead by a policeman. Annie learns more about Candyman. He's a distant relative and is able to live on because his soul was trapped in a mirror. Annie destroys the mirror, defeating Candyman. Annie then has Paul's daughter, who she names Caroline, after her great-great-lots-of-greats-grandmother, the girl Candyman fell in love with. Candyman, a mob, and a policeman are the killers. She has Paul's daughter? What a weird way to phrase that. Paul's her uh, husband that Candyman kills. I just wanted to make it clear that it wasn't some type of Candyman Immaculate Conception. Oh, and they show the mob kill Candyman this time around, so they're on the list. Candyman 2, sweeter than ever. I'm not sure why I decided to check this out. I didn't particularly like the first one, but heard the sequel wasn't too bad. Candyman 2 is a little bit more cohesive. Like the first one, Candyman torments a blonde woman. Candyman has a thing for torturing blonde women. I'm not going to watch the third movie, but I'm willing to bet Candyman messes with a blonde lady. In the sequel, a lot of Candyman's victims are his direct descendants. Candyman loved Coraline. I mean Caroline. Coraline is a great movie that's based on a short story by Neil Gaiman. Candyman had a daughter with Caroline. Some of the people he's killing are his daughter's direct descendants. Why would he want to kill his own family? I know that his would-be stepdad led the mob, so Candyman's descendants are also descendants of evil stepdad. The family wasn't completely acknowledging Candyman's existence either, so in that case, he has to kill them. One thing he doesn't have to do is put the moves on his great-great-great-great-granddaughter Annie, but no one can ever truly understand why Candyman does what Candyman does. As a movie, Candyman 2 is competent. It's not as well shot or acted as the first movie. The acting in the sequel is abysmal. Annie's brother has a transatlantic accent in the beginning of the movie, which he later drops. Every scene he's in is hilarious due to his unbelievable delivery. Annie is played by Kelly Rowan of the OC fame. She's the best of the bunch, but this isn't her at the top of her game. The sound design is pretty awful. Sound effects that don't match what's happening on screen are used during unnecessary jump scares. Example, Annie's husband slowly walks up behind her and grabs her shoulder in a non-menacing way. Annie jumps for no reason while a pig squealing sound effect is played. Terrible jump scares in that same vein pop up throughout the whole movie. Philip Glass comes back to do the score, but it doesn't fit as well this time around. One of the themes also has three notes sung in an acapella style that sound like it should be followed by the James Bond theme, which made a lot of scenes unintentionally funny. The three notes would play, then I'd be compelled to go... 
you can hold your applause. The gore in the sequel isn't as good as it is in the first for the most part. There is a really cool part where Annie scratches into Candyman's face, making an opening for live bees to make their way out of his body. That was a fantastic visual and creepy idea. I could totally tell it was a fake head when I looked at the face instead of the bee escape hatch wound, but the effect still looked really neat. The face of the head prop should have been hidden a little better or left out of the shot entirely. When Candyman is defeated, some of the worst CGI effects I've ever seen are used. I'm not sure why it was decided to use an awful looking CGI shattered glass effect instead of having him crack all over with bees flying out like in the face scratch scene. I still don't believe bees attack people that are covered in honey. When they show a terrible looking CGI swarm of bees randomly appear and make its way to the slathered in honey candy man, it looks real bad. If bees do in fact attack people covered in honey, let me know. Pet warning, you see the body of a dead cat, it's not that bad. You know Candyman has to kill a pet and attack a blonde woman, it's in his contract. I only recommend watching the first Candyman since it's an iconic horror film, so you better believe I'm going to advise that you pass on the sequel. Just watch the OC instead if you need a Kelly Rowan fix. Number 4, Child's Play 2019, directed by Lars Klevberg. In Vietnam, a daydreaming employee is working on a Kaslin buddy doll. He's fired. The disgruntled employee turns off all the security measures on the doll and commits suicide. In the United States, Aubrey Plaza brings home a defective buddy doll to give her son Andy. The doll names itself Chucky. Andy and Chucky bond. Chucky is taught that violence is fun after seeing some clips from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre sequel. Aubrey has a new boyfriend named Shane that's a real jerk. Andy tells Chucky he wishes Shane would go away. Chucky kills him and gives Andy a watermelon with Shane's face on it as a gift. Andy and his friends remove Chucky's power source to stop any future death. A creepy janitor fixes Chucky, who then murders a bunch of other people by controlling Kaslin products. Andy, Aubrey, and a policeman eventually take Chucky down. Chucky is the killer. Or is a disgruntled Vietnamese employee the killer? What about violent horror movies are the killers? They are what rotted Chucky's mind. I've seen a lot of horror movies, so I obviously too have killed countless people and adorned produce with their skin faces. Let's go with Chucky. He had free will after all. I never personally got into the original Child's Play series. I want to say I've only seen the original movie. With that said, what did I think of Child's Play 2019 as a standalone movie? During the first 10 minutes, I thought I was going to hate this movie. That's mainly due to the fact that some jackass decided to cast Aubrey Plaza as the mother of a 13-year-old boy. Before she referred to him as her son, I honestly thought they went with the brother and sister route, which would have worked a lot better. Having Aubrey be Andy's sister wouldn't even change anything. Aubrey Plaza is not a believable mom. If her character got pregnant at 16, then yes, she could technically have a 13 year old son. In a vacuum, maybe Mom Brie Plaza works, but she's been in a ton of stuff where the last thing you'd call her is motherly. Liv Tyler appears to have been considered, which would have made a lot more sense. Once I got over some of the worst casting I've ever seen, I had a lot of fun with Child's Play. All the dialogue is hammy and silly. Sometimes the cheeseball dialogue is fun, but at other times it's real lame. My eyes did a full rotation through the back of my head when a young kid told Chucky to say this is for Tupac while having him stab a stuffed animal which Chucky then uses while killing a victim later on. The kid is around 13 years old. He'd probably tell Chucky something like this is for XXX Tentacion which I guarantee I mispronounced. All I know is that dude was a rapper and all around terrible person who was killed. I'm not saying he's in the same league as Tupac, I'm just saying that's what the kids are into nowadays. 
Most of the acting in Child's Play is bad. I've never found Aubrey Plaza that great of an actor, which makes the casting choice even more perplexing. I watched a recent interview she did on Hot Ones, and she said she doesn't even like horror movies. It's mind-boggling that she was cast as the mob. She's not believable in the role, isn't great at acting, and probably didn't even really push to be in the movie herself. Mark Hamill works as Chucky. I have no attachment to the normal voice. Gabriel Bateman plays Andy, and he's pretty good given that a lot of his scenes are just him and the Chucky doll. He wasn't particularly amazing, but compared to everyone else, the kid knocked it out of the park. Did you know that one of the first successful human clones is a clone of Jack Black? He's listed as Trent Redicop. But you aren't fooling me, black market clone scientists. JB's clone plays the overly creepy building custodian. Him and the Shane character are both presented as cartoonishly unlikable. They are Chucky's first two human victims. Quick pet warning, dead cat. You see a reflection, which is whatever. But later on, Chucky plays the cat's death screams, which will definitely be a little disturbing for feline fans. If you don't want to hear that, plug your ears when you see Chucky in Andy's room the night after the dead cat reveal. Back to the ridiculously vile first two human victims. I'm assuming they decided to make them so cartoonishly evil that you would still kind of be on Chucky's side after he dispatches them, but murder's murder. Even though the creeps deserve to be punished, murder is a little overboard. Chucky eventually starts murdering all willy-nilly, so those two didn't have to be so one note. My favorite thing in the whole film has to be the watermelon with the human face. First of all, it looks great. Pretty much all of the on-screen gore and Chucky-related effects are practical and impressive. Shane's face on the watermelon looks great. I'm not sure how Chucky managed to keep the eyes and teeth intact when skinning the face, but the doll's a true artist. There are a ton of hilarious and dread-inducing moments surrounding the melon head that I won't spoil here. I will bring up that Shane dies while taking down some Christmas lights. He doesn't shut them off for some reason, and even when they aren't plugged in and are being shredded, they stay on. I get them being on makes for a more interesting shot, so I'll give it a pass. If you've seen any promotional material for Child's Play, I'm assuming you've seen Aubrey Plaza tied up. Somehow she gets herself free, which doesn't make sense, but to be fair, your suspension of disbelief has to be insanely high when watching this movie. I mean, come on, have you seen these buddy dolls? No one would want these creepy little buggers in their house. At one point, Andy and two of his pals decide they need to destroy Chucky because of his murderous tendencies. All they do is mess up his battery stomach compartment. If I was in possession of a murderous doll, you better believe I'd do whatever I can to destroy it. I'd mess it up so bad you'd have to use something like voodoo to fix it. Obviously, a sequel is hinted at because at the end of the movie, the people involved with defeating Chucky incompetently leave the microchip that stores his unhinged AI intact. As someone with no attachment to the original Child's Play series, I recommend checking out this new reboot of Small Soldiers, I mean Child's Play. It's entertaining. I wouldn't call it a good movie, but I had enough fun watching it. The new take on the doll being an AI and whatnot works a lot better in these modern times. Remember when Twitter turned Microsoft's AI chatbot into a Nazi in like, a day? I will admit that the use of Child's Play IP was completely unnecessary, but I get that in this day and age, you need to have that brand recognition. Number 5, Crystal Eyes, originally titled Morada de Cristal, 2017 directed by Ezekiel Endelman and Leandro Montejano. Alexi Carpenter is the top model and cover girl. She has problems with drugs and alcohol. A runway show is going on. Alexi is the last model and her brother is there to see her. Alexi ends up accidentally lighting herself on fire and dies. A year later, a masked killer that looks like a mannequin starts murdering people in the fashion industry that are trying to cash in on Alexi's name. The killer is revealed to be Alexi's brother, Matthias, in drag. Matthias thinks they're Alexi. Matthias is knocked out by a makeup artist Alexi wronged. 
Matthias wakes up in a hospital and continues killing. Intoxicated Behavior and Matthias Carpenter, aka La Silhouette, are the killers. I watched Crystal Eyes at Tear Tuesday here in Austin at the Alamo Draft House. It's an awesome weekly horror screening that I used to go to all the time until I decided to be lazy and cheap and watch spooky movies in the comfort of my own home. I hadn't been in years, but I had to attend to catch this screening of Crystal Eyes, which is incredibly hard to track down. The filmmakers don't have a distributor yet, so the only way to see the movie at this time appears to be film festivals and other screenings. This is the second feature-length film from Ezekiel Endelman and Leandro Montejano of Toy Boys Inc. Movies, the first being Un Viernes Negro, Parte Dos, La Maldición del Gato, which translates to A Black Friday Part 2, The Curse of the Cat. Part 1 was a short film. Both parts can be watched on YouTube, so I might brush up on my Spanish since it doesn't have subtitles and check it out for the next episode. You know how so many movies and shows these days are trying to cash in on 80s nostalgia? Crystal Eyes captures the 80s aesthetic and scores so perfectly that it actually looks like an 80s movie. It's breathtaking. The cinematography is on point. The framing of shots is fantastic. Crystal Eyes has some of the most incredible production design I have ever seen. Miniatures and sets were used to heighten the style of the film. The head of the fashion magazine's mansion feels like it was pulled right out of Suspiria. The colors in Crystal Eyes are vibrant. Neon glows are used liberally to great effect. All the lighting is great. The costume design is impeccable. Your eyes will love this movie. The score is synth-based, it's melodramatic and whimsical at the same time. The whole movie feels like a crazy 80s soap opera slasher. La Silhouette is played by Isis Trash, a drag queen from Argentina. Isis is fantastic as the mannequin killer. Her movements are stiff and, well, mannequin-like. Isis Trash not only did an amazing job as La Silhouette, but she also played a major role in the art design along with the Toy Boys. I can't find a source, but at Terror Tuesday, the presenter said that almost all of the production and art design can be attributed to Isis Trash. Ezekiel Endelman, Leandro Montejano, and Isis Trash are all credited as art directors on the film. I'm interested in learning more about Isis Trash, but she doesn't have much of an online presence. Maybe she'll end up on Dragula, the spooky version of RuPaul's Drag Race someday. Now since this is Toy Boy's second and most ambitious feature length movie, it's not perfect. One glaring technical issue is the sound recording. Now I'm not sure if the heavy hum and background static was intentional or not. The background noise does add to the ambiance and makes you further believe that this is actually a low budget 80s slasher film, but in the trailer for the movie the dialogue is much clearer and static free. Static aside, some characters sound softer than others at times. These audio issues don't detract from the film at all though, they make it feel even more 80s. I know that everyone is 80s out at this point, but this movie actually does it correctly. I wouldn't bat an eye if I saw Chopping Mall followed by Crystal Eyes at a drive-in and was told it was 80s movies night. If I didn't know that Crystal Eyes came out in 2017. Crystal Eyes is an immersive dive into a vibrant make-believe fashion scene in 80s Argentina. It overflows with charm and style. The acting is campy and perfect. The gore is there. That aspect could have been a little better, honestly, especially when a woman's decapitated head is shown on a desk and you can literally see her shoulders. The movie's still amazing, though. I definitely recommend checking out Murata de Cristal, English translation, Crystal Eyes. I'm not exactly sure how you can check it out. But if you hear about a screening near you or the film gets distributed, it's a must-watch. I didn't even go over the billion references in the movie, like when a mirror shard is used as a murder weapon as an homage to prom night. The movie's littered with that stuff. Number 6, Blade, 1998, directed by Stephen Norrington. Blade, a half-human, half-vampire, hunts vampires with his mentor, Whistler. Blade's mom died from a vampire bite, but Blade lived. 
A vampire named Frost wants to fulfill an ancient prophecy and summon a blood god. Blade kills a bunch of vampires. Frost and his crew beat up Whistler who kills himself to end the pain. Blade then goes to confront Frost, finds out his mom is a vampire, kills more vampires including his mom. Frost is empowered by the blood god. Blade kills Frost and Blade ends up in Moscow. Vampires are the killers. Other stuff happens in the movie. There is a girl that Blade saves, but those are the main points. To start things off, yes, I have somehow not seen any of the Blade movies. I'm just as shocked as you listeners at this revelation. There are vampires in the movie Blade, so it counts as a horror movie for Blank is the Killer's purposes. This is a very prestigious horror podcast, I know. Blade came out in 1998 and was directed by Stephen Norrington. The only other movie I've seen from Norrington is The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, which I remember being entertaining. Norrington started off as a special effects artist and the biggest movie he worked on is Aliens. He also worked on a movie called Split Second that sounds neat. I might check out that and another movie he directed called Death Machine in the future. Anyway, before becoming a director, Norrington was an effects guy. So how are the effects in Blade? It's a mixed bag. There's no way I can talk about Blade without letting you know that it has a ton of awful dated CGI effects. Almost all of the CGI is garbage. It was the late 90s. You can point at Starship Troopers and say not all CGI from that decade was bad, but let's be real, most CGI in the 90s is terrible. A great example of bad CGI in Blade is when some old vampires as skeletons crawl out of their own mouths then have flying demon bat skeletons crawl out of the normal skeletons as pie holes like Russian nesting dolls. I'd love to see something that ridiculous done practically. Now Blade does have some amazing practical effects work. The standouts being an obese vampire named Pearl that looks fantastically disgusting and a part where an old pure blood vampire is taken out into the sun. The way that vampire's skin rips apart as the sun rises is incredible. Some other decent practical effects include the makeup for a vampire that Blade lights on fire and cuts pieces off of, and some scenes where vampires expand into bubbly messes before exploding. To be clear, in the bubbly vampire scenes, the actually made bubbly vampires look great, but the CGI used in conjunction with the bubbly vampires doesn't fit. Not all the practical effects are good. For some reason, a doll that looks nothing like a newborn baby was used when Blade was born. It's weird. At one point in the movie, Whistler is supposed to be beat to a pulp, but when Blade finds him, Whistler is just covered in some fake blood. He doesn't even have a swollen eye or anything. Whistler had to kill himself. There was no way he could wash off all that fake blood. Most of the acting in Blade is terrible. Frost is played by Steven Dorff and his delivery is hilarious. He's young and greasy, what was considered hot in the late 90s and early 2000s for some reason. I thought Frost should have been an old dude and it turns out he was an old German dude in the comics. Wesley Snipes is acting as Blade isn't great either, but Wesley Snipes looks super cool. Blade isn't a very likable character. He's a jerk to pretty much everyone around him. At one point, he throws a cop all around an innocent girl's apartment, breaking a bunch of her things. He's also the most conspicuous person ever. He beats up that same cop in broad daylight, then pulls out a really cool looking gun in a crowded public area. He drives a Dodge Charger that you can't miss. At one point, he assaults a vampire compound on a motorcycle. Before crashing into the compound, he alerts all the guards who are already on the lookout for him by revving the engine. Blade is no tactician. The best action sequence in Blade is the first one when he attacks a literal bloodbath rave. The blood rave seems like a huge waste of blood to me, but hey, Blade fighting a bunch of vampires fully covered in blood looks awesome. The camera work during this introduction to Blade is well done. There's lots of neat camera movement. Unfortunately, the first fight sequence is the best one. All the others are pretty may in comparison, especially the lame, climactic sword fight. The sword fight wasn't in the original cut. I think the movie would have been better without it. The punch and other hit sounds throughout the movies are beyond cheesy and fake sounding, which I found funny. They're like old video game hit sounds. 
Blade has one of the worst car chase scenes I've ever seen, if you can even call it a car chase. I assume the Blade team wasn't able to film a legit car chase for some reason or another, which is why they ended up cutting together a bunch of weird sped up car shots where the cars are never in the same shot and calling it a day. Frost is the big bad in the movie. Blade's mom is revealed to be a living vampire. Does that make sense? I know vampires are dead. You know what I mean? Blade thought his mom was dead dead. He didn't know she was dead vampire. Frost is literally banging Blades' his mom, which is hilarious. There's also some uncomfortable sexual tension between Blade and his mom. Blade isn't into it, but his mom is. Come to think of it, Blade isn't a sexual character, which is great. He doesn't care about the character that's supposed to be his love interest. He just wants to turn vamps into dust. Blade is a fun time. It has a banging techno soundtrack. It's not a great movie, and a lot of the effects in it are figuratively covered in dust. I still had a great time watching it. It is two hours long and drags in a few places, but I overall recommend checking out Blade. One last thing, at one point in the movie, Blade's human friend is being threatened by Frost. He says he'll kill her or turn her. To which I thought she responded, Go ahead, bite me. I'll just kill myself. I did it before and I can do it again. That makes absolutely no sense, but that's what Cad and I both heard. Turns out the character actually says she'll cure herself, not kill herself. Duh. I'll be checking out the next Blade movie soon. I gotta see what Guillermo del Toro did with this universe. Number 7, Elvira Movies. I recently checked out two of Elvira's big movies, Elvira Mistress of the Dark and Elvira's Haunted Hills. At first I planned on having Elvira Mistress of the Dark as one of the main movies in this episode, but I decided to babble incoherently about both movies here in the seventh topic instead. I had a ton of fun watching Elvira Mistress. The wordplay and expectations subverting jokes are hilarious. The cinematography is surprisingly well thought out. I thought Mistress was just going to be a cash grab movie featuring Elvira. That's Haunted Hills. That movie is ass. The jokes don't land, the movie drags, and one of the main characters, Vladimir Helzebus, is a groan inducing piece of garbage. Cassandra Peterson, Elvira's real name, and John Paragon wrote for both movies, but Sam Egan only had a hand in writing Mistress. Write an Elvira movie without Sam, end up with boring ham. That's a classic saying we all know and love. Haunted Hills is set in the 1800s in a castle. Mistress is set in modern times in a prudish town. Elvira in a prudish town is much funnier than Elvira in an old musky castle. The score for Mistress is campy and amazing at the same time. You got some hard rock, you got some goofy stuff. On the other hand, Haunted Hills soundtrack is lame. Don't watch Haunted Hills. I'm going to focus mainly on Mistress now. Things I really liked in Mistress, Elvira's dope car, her inherited fluffy punk poodle, the Puritan townsfolk's reactions to Elvira, the witty writing, the cheeseball score, the inclusion of a bazooka, and all the performances. Mistress is a fun movie. Before I sat down and watched these movies, I hadn't really interacted with much of Elvira's content. The only Elvira thing I got my hands on was a large slot machine in Vegas, and boy oh boy did I lose big on that machine. Don't play the Elvira slot machine in Vegas. It's garbage. If you want a horror slot machine to play, check out the Gremlins one instead. That machine is awesome. It's got dope animations and gimmicks. Anyway, Elvira. If you are an Elvira fan and know about some of her other stuff I should check out, let me know at blankisthekiller at gmail.com. I've already seen Pee Wee's Big Adventure. I didn't realize she was in that until recently. She's not in the Elvira getup. Wait a minute. Elvira, Mistress of the Dark is pretty similar to Pee Wee's Big Adventure. I guess I like movies where oddball characters go on a road trip to get something. It makes sense the format of the movies is so similar, seeing as Elvira and Pee Wee Herman were both created while Cassandra Peterson and Paul Rubens were in an improv sketch comedy troupe called The Groundlings. Elvira and Pee Wee are pals. A lot of famous funny people are alumni of The Groundlings. In closing, watch Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. It's a riot.
Blank is the Killer 48, Killer B's Deadly Dolls, and Fashion Fatale's coffin has been nailed shut. If you liked what you heard, why not leave a review on iTunes or email me directly at blankisthekiller at gmail.com with any questions, recs, concerns. You can also interact with me in the comments section of the bi-weekly Blank is the Killer post, which you can find on Instagram at Bonesaw Baker. A big thanks to Sticker Fridge for hosting the podcast. Listen to other podcasts on the network. Next episode will be up on July 14th. Expect Blade movies and Midsummer. Pagan, please let the latter live up to the hype. Until then, remember to never show an AI horror movies or let it talk to anyone on the internet.